Uh, good afternoon. Um, let's get started. Um, I want to uh, welcome you here and thank you for attending the uh, College of Engineering Distinguished uh, Lecture Series presentation uh, today. Um, it is my great pleasure on behalf of Dean Lavernia and the college to welcome Dr. Sandro Mahajan. Um, he's an associate professor uh, of applied science and engineering at Hollings College of Engineering and also a um, visiting associate professor of um, uh, electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Um, the title of his talk today is Principle Based Use of Digital Technology to Improve STEM Learning. Um, let me say a few words about Dr. Mahajan before we get started. Um, he has uh, been living on two continents, uh, was born in England, uh, raised in New Jersey, uh, and then got degrees from uh, in math and physics from uh, Stanford and Oxford. Uh, then you did your um, graduate work at Caltech in uh, uh, theoretical physics, and um, uh, then a postdoc at Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah, faculty. <laughs> um, faculty. Yeah. Um, he was. Uh, we just had uh, actually a, a, ch a chat about uh, the work of Louis Benezé, is uh, um, uh, an admirer, I think, of uh, this uh, early um, uh, educator uh, in the U.S who was a big proponent of, uh, actually a big opponent of uh, rote learning and, and you know, drilling um, uh, uh, exercises. Uh, and himself, Dr. Mahajan, has been a, a, an advocate of uh, the art of educated uh, guesses. And uh, if you have a chance to check out his book, uh, Street Fighting Mathematics, um, and I won't remember the whole subtitles, but uh, it's on the MIT Press website. It's actually uh, published on the, uh, under a, um, uh, Creative Commons license, so it's uh, freely available. Fasc fascinating book about uh, how you can use uh, uh, estimates and how you can build understanding uh, using this type of approaches. Uh, you can also dig out online. Um, Dr. Mahajan gave an interview to NPR here and now, and he has at the end of the interview there is a, a very nice um, a segment where he estimates how much, uh, how many dollars we spend per year on diapers in the U.S. Uh, right off the cuff. Those are those are really nicely done. Um, you have a new book that just came out yes. at, uh, last this week. month. Right? This, this week. week. Yeah. This week um, on the uh, insight. Uh, it's about science and engineering, right? Yeah, the article in science and engineering. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and that's also under the Creative Commons license, yeah. so it's also uh, something that you can download. Um, <laughs> So uh, please uh, join me in giving a warm UC Davis welcome to Dr. Mahajan. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. So what I want to first convince you of is that there's lots of learning that still has to be done by our students. Uh, and this is everywhere. I, everywhere I've taught, I've seen this. And the example is this, uh, which is you ask physics students for the forces on a steel ball. So imagine a steel ball, and you drop it from, say, one meter above a table, bounces off a steel table, bounces up about the same height. And the question is, what are the forces on the ball at three different times in its flight? So the first point is here while it's falling. Second point is just at the instant when it's stationary during its bounce. And the third point is some point while it's rising up again after bouncing. So you ask them, okay, draw the forces, forget about air resistance, we're not trying to make it complicated, you just want to get at your understanding. So they'll agree that, okay, if you forget about air resistance, it's just the weight while it's falling. Now, a little bit more complicated for students is this piece. They'll start to say while it's rising, well, there's some upward force because it's moving upwards. Uh, and then you can eventually convince them, well, actually, not really. There's got to be still the weight. Where did that go? But now we come to the piece in the middle. So they'll agree, OK, there's a weight, and there's an upward force as well, this one time from the table. And then you ask them, okay, how big is the upward force? So now what I'm going to ask you is not how big is the upward force to figure that out, but to try to think like the students. So how big is the upward force according to the students? So this force right here, what do students say? What's their most common answer? So take one minute, introduce yourself to one or two neighbors, and see if you can figure out your prediction for what students say. And I'll take some suggestions. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so any suggestions for what you think in your group that students might have said? Same as the weight, okay, so uh, any other votes for same as the weight? Okay, uh, other suggestions? More than the weight. Okay, more than the weight. Yeah, any quantitative predictions on how much more? Some might say zero because it's not moving. Right. Okay, that not moving. Okay, so zero because it's not moving. When you say same as the weight, uh, what reason do you think they might give? Because it stops right at the bottom. Right, okay, so it stopped, therefore, so, uh, and so what's the reasoning chain? So it stopped, uh, therefore. Well, if it were in, a, if it were in elastic, it would just stick there, and then it would be the same, right? Okay, so it stopped, and in this case it's bouncing, but if it weren't bouncing, it should still be zero. Right. Total force. Right. Okay, so total force should be zero, so this should balance the weight, right. or there should be zero force here because it's not moving. So in some way, not moving normal force equals the weight. So <laughs> that is, in fact, what most students say. 90%, so I found this everywhere I've taught. So I've asked this question at Olin. I've asked this question at MIT. I asked it of the students in Cambridge. Uh, and 90% will say that the for upward force equals the weight. So now I should say the students in Cambridge actually tested their knowledge of Newtonian uh, physics before. So the first day they came to Cambridge, I gave them all the force concept inventory, which is sort of the physicist thermometer. It measures how Newtonian, how physics-like are you thinking, at least in this one domain. And you get a temperature reading from 0 to 100%. Uh, and allegedly, if you're above 80%, then that's good. You're thinking like a Newtonian physicist, not like an Aristotelian. So these students. And our goal often in physics teaching is we'd like the students who come in, you know, with 30, 40, 50 percent to get up to 85 percent. Well, these students in Cambridge, they all started at 93 percent. Well, that was their average. There was one at 86 percent and one at 100 percent, but they were all at 93 percent. That's the first day they came in because they've taken the equivalent of six AP exams in math, physics, and chemistry before they came. Uh, so that's the high school education system. So they came, but they still say force is equal to the weight. Now, how can you show them that something might not be quite right for, about this? And so to do that, uh, actually, uh, could, could I have a volunteer? OK, please come on up. Uh, so if you could, uh, let's see, I'll use this. If you could place your hand right here. Thanks. OK, so here's my rock. <laughs> All right. So no, yeah, it's, it's a little risky here. <laughs> I'm sure the university has good insurance. All right. So now I'm going to lay the rock right in your hand. Now uh, that force from the rock onto your hand, that's the weight, right? Does it hurt? Not, not much. No, OK, great. OK, so on the count of three, one, two, the, wait. Why do you want to move your hand? No, no, I don't want to. I'm oh, just oh, oh, you're just terrified. <laughs> right. So one, Everybody two, watching. three. I'm going to drop the rock. One, two, three. Okay. Right. So you want to move your hand. Uh, yeah. But right, you're feeling the pressure. Now, why? Because you just told me, you know, 90% of the students just said, well, when the rock lands and bounces off the hand, it's still the force is equal to mg, the weight. And that didn't hurt. So what's the problem? You know, why are you trying to move your hand? So now, Students start to think, well, OK, maybe it's not equal to the weight. Maybe it's something more. So any votes on how, what, how much more they think it is? Uh, depends on what height you do it from. Because that would be good. Uh, <laughs> so, but there's a number they often come to after this. Twice. Twice. Right, and I've always wondered. Well, I need your hand still. Sure, sure. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put two rocks. 
in your hand. So that's twice the weight of one rock. Does that hurt? No. Okay, so now still one, two, three, <laughs> two mg there, right? No. And so now students think, well, okay, that twice must be a big underestimate. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. All right. So the point of that is that students can have vast knowledge, experience, solving lots of problems, but still not actually understand what they're doing and still not be able to use the concepts to reason about the physical world and connect it to their everyday experience and explain what goes on in the world. So for me, that means that our teaching has failed, their learning has failed. It's going to be very brittle. They can't transfer it. So there's lots of learning still to be done, which is I wanted to convince you of. And this is a universal issue. It cuts across all universities I've seen, many, any area you ask about this. And the other point is that there's lots of improvement of our teaching as well. And so here is a study. So this is for online courses. This was a study of 50 MOOC courses, so massive open online courses, uh, published in the future, 2015, actually. Uh, so it's an early online version of the paper. Uh, and so what they did is they rated all the 50 MOOC courses from 0 to 72. 72 was the best. And what they found was that they ranged from 3 to 25, with a median of 8 out of 72. And most of those eight points came from organization. Uh, so yes, the, the weeks were packaged one week after the next. There was learning objectives. But the instructional design quality is low. So basically, they got almost two, zero, one, or two points for the rest of the instructional design criteria. So there's serious problems with what students are learning. There's serious problems in what we're doing and teaching overall. But does that mean we should all give up and go home? No, because what I'd like to show you is ways of using digital tools, not as the end, but as the means to long-lasting learning. Uh, and what I'm going to first do is show you an organizing framework uh, from the education research, and then illustrations using digital tools that are freely available so that people can actually do tomorrow or the day after, after doing some software setup. Uh, but the idea isn't necessarily that each example you have to copy and use in your own teaching. It's that to illustrate the organizing framework, the principles behind it, and how you can use them and get ideas for using them in your own teaching. So this framework is the ICAP framework, the ICAP hierarchy. So ICAP stands for, uh, it's from Michelin Chi from the uh, Arizona State University. Uh, she's a professor in education there. Uh, and so ICAP is the first four letters of interactive, constructive, active, or passive. So the motivation for this was that <clears throat> now it's become more and more clear that passive learning bad, active learning good. Sort of like two legs good, four legs bad. Uh, but when you try to use that idea to figure out, okay, let's look at the education literature. Let's see, does active learning really help? You see this big mess. Sometimes it helps a bit. Sometimes it helps a lot. You can't really tell. It turns out to actually make any sense of what's going on, you have to divide active into three categories. So there's barely active, constructive, and interactive. So here is at the very bottom, we still have passive learning. So that's when you're just paying attention, uh, watching a lecture or a video. So one of the reasons I gave you a question to think about in the beginning is so that we're not just passive. But the re result of passive learning is just minimal understanding for the students. And we've seen that you know, in over and over in the uh, bouncing ball test and many other tests like that. I think it's showing the result of that minimal understanding. So active learning at the barest level, that's one step better. You're doing something with your hand or body, uh, but you're not adding to the information. That's the crucial distinction. So that may be, for example, taking notes but just taking notes or copying important highlighting passages. So the information in the text is still there, and you're just highlighting certain passages. So that will lead just to shallow understanding. It's better than minimal, but it's still shallow. That the next level up is constructive. So there you're adding to the information. So this was the crucial distinction that she found. Uh, so there, for example, you could be summarizing text. So the text had a bunch of words, and you're putting new words in 
of your own interpretation. You're making a concept map. You're explaining to yourself what's going on. So that leads to deeper understanding that might transfer. And at the highest level is interactive. So there's discussion with a tutor or with peers. And that leads to understanding that might create new ideas, which is what we want. But we want, I would say, all of these, certainly at the top two levels. And the third level, OK, if that's all we can do, so be it. And so what I want to show you is examples of using digital tools to climb this hierarchy and then to do, uh, do you have a question? Yeah. So, so if you were, would it be correct to think if you give a lecture course, if the students take notes, they do homework problems and talk about them with other students and they've covered all four? <coughs> that's a good question. So, they, so if they just hear the lecture, that's passive. And they're probably not learning much from that. And then, if they do the homework, it depends on what the homework is. So for example, uh, let me ask everyone, what do you think multiple choice questions are in this hierarchy when they're doing? Uh, it's just active. That's right, because the choices are in front of them. So they're not adding to the information. So it depends on what the homework is. But if the homework is actually requiring them to do constructive activities, then that's beneficial, even if the lecturer wasn't. And if, they're, if they know how to the piece about interactive that's important here is that it has to be interactive using constructive dialogue. So they have to be somehow adding to each other's mental models. And that's where the interactive benefit comes from. So if the interactive, if the discussion that they're doing rises to that level, yes, they're going to benefit from that greatly. And so I'll show you ways that you can actually get that to happen. But if the lecture is just passive, why do it? You know, so there are ways of making the lecture more active too. So the first illustration I'll give you is constructive visualizations. So these uh, came from my uh, edX course, Street Fighting Mathematics, uh, which, uh, as Jean-Pierre said, was, is this book, which then I converted to this course, Street Fighting Math. So edX is the consortium made by, uh, first by Harvard and MIT, and now there's many universities across the world that participate. And all the courses are freely available. And the uh, platform itself is open source software. So I think George Mason or Georgia Tech, and George Mason I think it is, I know they're one university that actually just runs their own instance of this software. But anyone can run it. The code is freely licensed. You can set up your own instance. Uh, but again, the actual implementation in the software is not so much what I'm focused on, but the principles behind it. So here, the example I'm going to show you is from near the end of the book uh, in the section on reasoning by analogy. And the problem was to use <coughs> analogy reasoning to work out the bond angle in methane. So here's methane, here's carbon, hydrogen, 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 and what's this angle here? Without doing all the vector calculus and trigonometry uh, chicken scratching, let's say. And find some way of knowing what the answer should be. So just get some insight into it. Uh, and so how did that problem get turned into a constructive uh, activity, which the activity that my co-instructor and I designed uh, was to make a regular tetrahedron. So here, this uh, became sort of a mini game. So here is tetrahedron, which has four corners. They had to make a regular tetrahedron, uh, where all the sides are the same length. And corners A and B those vertices are fixed. And by adjusting these sliders, they could move C and D around. And here are all the distances between each of the corners. So there are six distances up there. Uh, and they move the sliders around. And you can start to see some of the distances changing. Now the question is, they first have to think, what should all the distances be? So that requires a little bit of constructive activity right there. Because they have to think, well, a and B are fixed, and they're one apart. So that means if it's going to be a regular tetrahedron, everything has to be one. So I have to make all these distances go to one. So by, and here A, B is one. So by moving the sliders around and moving C and D around, you can see the distances, these first two distances here, getting closer to one. And now these guys are done. These are all three the same. And these guys are now being worked on. Uh, so this one's good. These two are still a mess. 
1.15, almost there, close there. Now everybody's uh, at the uh, end point. You've made a regular tetrahedron, and you can view it from different sides. So there, <coughs> what they were doing was constructive. They were adding to the information because they didn't actually have a regular tetrahedron, and they had to actually make it. And it also had the benefit of activating their knowledge about geometry and trigonometry, and especially geometry, so that they could then follow the derivations and discussion and questions that were going to follow. So that's constructive visualization as one example of how to do a constructive activity. The next one is, you know, people often say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, you know, mostly you can do multiple choice with digital tools, but you can't do anything more complicated than multiple choice, which raise, rises only to the level of active. But can you do proofs, which show up a lot in STEM education? Well, here is constructing formula explanations. Uh, so here, we'll use those to promote, to rise to the constructive level and promote minds on learning. So here is a proof that this is the small angle approximation, which you use all the time in physics to make nonlinear equations linear. Uh, basically, nonlinear equations, you can't do a damn thing. Linear equations, you have some prayer of solving. Uh, so here, they know the small angle approximation for the sine. Like I like to say, if sin vanishes from the world, then sine theta equals theta. Uh, and they usually remember that. Uh, so using the sinless form of sine theta, uh, can you do the same thing for cosine of theta? And I've asked them to show that it's 1 minus theta squared over 2. And what they have to do is like a Sudoku puzzle. Sudoku, Sudoku. Uh, uh, and they have to put in all the pieces that are down here and drag and drop them into the boxes in the formula. So again, they have to construct something. Uh, and so you can see how that works. So the first thing you should do if you're the student is basically just check whether you even understand the question. Uh, which means the question is said, prove cosine of theta equals 1 minus theta squared over 2. So you better put those over there. <laughs> so you can warm up your way to more and more complicated constructive activities, but you can start with a simple constructive activity. All right, so it's scaffolded. Now, what should you put in all these other boxes? Well, you need to use sine theta, so let's put that in somewhere. Uh, and so it's here. Cosine of theta is 1 minus sine squared theta, and then you have to put something here and here to make that actually true. So here are some of the other choices that you have which are being made visible. There's a 1 and a 1 half. So you put the 1 half up there to put the square root. And now what goes down here? So this is saying, this is forcing them to read equations as you would maybe a, a novel more. You try to figure out what are these characters doing, what's their meaning. Uh, because they're used to just actually letting their eyes glaze over each symbol. So what you want to do is say, okay, well this box here explains this term with an approximation. So you have to approximate this term and put the approximation here and make sure that whatever you put here justifies this whole argument. And so if you try theta squared over 2 and then you say, okay, let me check my answer by clicking the check box, you get an X. It says, no, that's not right. I, if I'd done it better, it would have actually maybe given you a hint and said, what should you think about? Uh, but I hadn't yet learned how to do hint problems there. I should say, I promised to talk about the limitations of digital tools. So one of the limitations is that this kind of process of constructing these questions takes a fair amount of time. So much so that in this conversion process, I ended up with shingles. <laughs> so it can be a very busy process. Uh, but you, you know, it's the power law of learning. So the first time you do it, you get shingles. The second time, it only takes half as much time. The third time, it takes one third as much time. Uh, and so <clears throat> the infinite time you do it, it takes no time at all. All right, so <laughs> theta squared over two, that's not right. Put it, make theta squared, and then that's correct. So you get your green check. So you've now constructed the proof in it, uh, by using the pieces that were there. So it's actually possible for the computer to check it but it's still quite a high level activity from the start to the finish. So here, that's again constructive, adding to the information there, uh, putting it together. Okay, so now, can we go the next level up? Can we go higher towards the interactive? And so what I'll show you next is adaptive hints 
which I touched on. Uh, and adaptive hints can get you halfway there, halfway between constructive and interactive. So let's see how that works. So here's an example. This is logarithms, uh, which again is a subject that students have a terrible time with uh, because, well, this is my rant about logarithms. So our inherent way of looking at the world is logarithmic. We look at the world naturally in terms of ratios. That's twice as big. It turns out lions, uh, they judge troop sizes of invading troops of lions basically by ratio of the invading troop size to their own pack size, and then they decide whether they should retreat or attack. And it's based on the ratio. So the ratio reasoning goes way back in evolution. And it's built into our mental hardware. But our math teaching actually beats it out of us, teaches us additive reasoning, which is much less effective for reasoning about the world, and then teaches us how to do ratio reasoning as a computational structure on top of the additive reasoning. We teach them all the rigmarole algorithms for logarithms and all the rules, log of A plus B, no, log of A times B is log of A times log of B, or is it log of A plus log of B? Students have no idea. It's just basically random walk in formula space. Because, <laughs> uh, because they actually didn't understand what was going on, and they lost their logarithmic intuition early on. Uh, so I wanted to give them actually a feel for logarithms and how big they are. Uh, and this was in street fighting math. So I told them logarithm of 10, this is a natural logarithm, which says you know, how many factors of E, 2.718, are in 10. And there's roughly 2.3 factors. It's pretty accurate. And so they had to use the idea of successive approximation, which is a the theme of that chapter, to correct that estimate to work out the logarithm of 11, ideally within 0.1% accuracy and within 10 seconds if possible. OK, so here's how that kind of reasoning worked in the digital system. So if they put in minus 1 and they said check, it said that's not correct, but it gave them a hint. It said logarithms of numbers less than 1 are negative. So that forced them to think, oh, wait a minute. So that means no negative number here could be right, because my number is bigger than 1. OK, so I have to then maybe review something about logarithms, but I'm forced to think about it. I can't just regurgitate. OK, now if they say 2.3, what should it say? <coughs> Pardon? Ln x equal to x uh, under only what, under certain conditions. So is it at all true? Uh, no, they've said 2.3, which is a logarithm of 10, oh. instead of working out the logarithm of oh, 11. It's, it's a monotonic function, so it can't come. Yeah, they should say something like, and, but I think you, should, you can even be a little friendlier. You can say you're halfway there. You found the big part. So you're there, you've got the big piece, but you just have to correct it. You know, and this is what you would say if you were a tutor talking to them. Right? If they were right next to you doing that, and they said, well, it's 2.3, you wouldn't say, oh, you're full of rubbish. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you could say what you said, which I think would help them. You say it's monotonic, uh, so it has to be bigger, which helps them. Or you could also say, you know, correct it, but you, you've got the big piece, so don't correct it too much. OK, so now suppose they say 2.397895. What should it say then? <laughs> yeah, tisk, 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 you use the calculator. <laughs> right, because that's actually, again, if I were their tutor and they reached for a calculator to do that, when I'd been teaching them how to do successive approximation, I would slap their hand, I would take their calculator, and I would throw it out the window. Uh, Except unless they had a particular calculator. I don't know if you know the QAMA calculator. Qualitative Approximate Mental Arithmetic. All right, so this calculator, it's a regular scientific calculator. So it's about this big, <coughs> maybe this big. And it has a regular display. And there's two parts, two little words under the display. There's EST and ANS. So now you type in your problem, for example, log of 10. And you hit equal. And then it starts flashing right above the EST. And it forces you to enter a reasonable estimate before it'll give you the answer. So I have two of these calculators, and they're waiting for when my daughters are old enough to need calculators, and those are the calculators they're going to get. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're excellent calculators. They're, you know, they're standard scientific calculators. The keys are a little junky, but uh, it's made really cheap, and they're made by these as far as I can see, these crazy Israeli guys who live in California who want to change math education for the better. And so they put in a lot of effort to 
the algorithm that decides what's a reasonable estimate. So I once had this experience of uh, when our lab at Caltech was closing down. Basically, our advisor had gone to Princeton uh, for a year, basically without us, and left us kind of parentless in Caltech. Uh, and finally, we were all graduating. The lab was closing down, so we had to go get digital audio tapes to back up all the computer labs. So I went down to the computer center and I said, okay, uh, how much for that, that tape? And they said, oh, that's $6.50. I said, mm, I probably need more than one. How much for that box of 10 of those DAT tapes? So the guy gets out his calculator, starts <laughs> typing away. And I think, oh, that must be the uh, 8.325 stupid percent sales tax in this county and city in this week. Uh, and then you know he's sweating a bit and then he says, $65. <laughs> and so the, that's when I realized that I couldn't go wrong by working on education because there's clearly a lot to do. But ever since then, I wanted a calculator that if you typed in 10 times 6.5, it would freeze up and say, this calculator will no longer operate until you take it to a mathematician and get some training, and then they will unlock it. All right. But so I tried that on the QAMA calculator, and it will not actually give you the answer until you type in 65. All right, so it doesn't freeze up, but it does effectively the same thing. All right, so that calculator, if they had, would be fine and wouldn't have actually allowed them to do this. All right. If they say 2.5, you still want to be nice to them, but it's a little bit off. So I said, well, that's not right, but a street fighter never gives up because uh, this is street fighting math. So I wanted to encourage them to keep using the approximations. And when they say 2.4, it then can report back, uh, that's right, that's what you're supposed to get to. And the logic is that 11 is 10% bigger than 10. Uh, so it's the logarithm of 1.1 bigger. And the logarithm of 1.1 is 0.1, not natural logarithm. So that's like the sin going away from the world approximation. It's the analog for logarithms. So I wanted them to just add 0.1 to 2.3, and I want that to be just how they see the world and to see the world of logarithms and numbers. Uh, so using a calculator harms that. And if they get 2.4, I know that they actually thought about it and it gives them the fractional error. Okay, so that uh, is somewhere between constructive and interactive. So they're not really, di they're not dialoguing with a tutor uh, or a human tutor or another student. They're not quite dialoguing with artificial intelligence uh, tutor. You know, the, what they were dialoguing with was a Python program that I wrote uh, that I put into that question that would, whenever it, it would be passed the answer, as a student would enter the answer, it would be passed to that program, which would then think about it, basically, and say, hmm, if it's within one millionth, one part in a million of the correct answer, they must have used a calculator. So then I would say, use the calculator, tisk, tisk. Uh, if they said 2.4, it said great, and it gave them the accuracy. Uh, so that program I wrote, you know, is maybe 50 lines long. Uh, so it's not artificial intelligence by any means, so that's why I don't put it all the way up to interactive, but it's somewhere between constructive and interactive. Okay, the uh, last <coughs> example is collaborative reading. And the goal here is to get all the way to the interactive level. How can we do that with digital tools? So this uses the tool Nota Bene. Uh, nb.mit.edu, which is written by uh, Sasha Zaito, uh, formerly a PhD student in electrical engineering, computer science at MIT, uh, and first published, oh, sorry, that year is wrong, it should be 2012, uh, uh, but published in 2012, but it's been in use for five or six years at MIT, and it's freely licensed software that you can either, again, like the edX platform, you can run it on your own servers, or you can just use the uh, MIT servers, uh, which people around the world are doing. And so what it is, is a collaborative PDF annotation. And just recently, you can actually annotate video as well. But what you do is you put up your reading, ideally before class, and you tell the students, read it and make comments on it. To make a comment, they just drag across an area they're confused about or want to say something about. A comment box pops up, they type their comment, and it shows up over here for all the other students to see, and then they can reply to it just like an email thread, and you can see all the comment, discussion, discussion. So here, what this was, this was actually the first reading in my course, the 
Art of Approximation in Science and Engineering, which is the one that became the book. So actually, how it became the book is that the students got pieces of the draft one at a time, and I used all their comments to revise the draft uh, and make the book, the final versions of the book. <coughs> uh, so, and NB is acknowledged uh, very warmly in the introduction for that reason. Uh, so here, uh, the, I'm trying to teach them how to estimate, and I wanted them to estimate the spacing of pits on a CD-ROM. So if you just take a CD and you look at it, there's all these little pits, which is why it makes all that beautiful colors, how far apart are the little holes where it stored all the data? And I didn't want, you know, I wanted them to estimate it. Uh, well, this estimate actually works by working out the data capacity, which starts with, okay, how long music can you play on a CD? What's the sampling rate? And what's the number of bits per sample? And so that's the data capacity. And then if you smear all those bits over this CD, how far apart do they have to be for the little pits? All right, so here, one of the students said, well, the spacing. They were confused by this, uh, the spacing. And they asked a really good question. They said, wouldn't this be the size of a pit plus the spacing between it and the next one? Uh, which is a good question. And then this other students replied, and they answered it. Uh, so what I would do is I would require that the students did this by 10 p.m. the night before the lecture. So they would read all that. And then what I would do, so the piece of the system that I wrote, uh, so you could see everything on the website like this, or uh, the piece I wrote, because uh, I didn't like reading everything on the web and clicking around like a monkey, I wanted to make a PDF file. So this, it downloads the PDF, original PDF file, and merges it with all the, and all the comments, and merges it with all the comments. So on the right side are the comments, and each box that the student selected gets a line to the comment about that box. And the boxes are semi-transparent pink, so as they overlap, they get darker. So you, what you do is you just go through there, and you look at this heat map. You can see, okay, they're a little worried there, not so bad there. And then they're terrorized here. So when I was looking at that, I never would have expected it. But actually what they're terrorized is, how do you know that human hearing goes up to 20 kilohertz? So the argument was, well, the sampling rate has to be 44 kilohertz or 40-ish kilohertz because the hearing frequency is 20 kilohertz. And you want to get all those frequencies in your music. And they said, well, how do you know it's 20 kilohertz? Where does that number come from? And you know, I, these were you know, MIT juniors and seniors, a few sophomores and freshmen. I hadn't expected that they would be so terrorized by an actual number. Uh, but, it's, again, but then I realized, oh, it's a number of uh, scaling about the world. And I realized, oh, yeah, that's why they're taking this course. Uh, and this is what I want to teach them is these kind of things. So I prepared a lecture based on that by saying, OK, let's actually, in lecture, think about frequencies. So let's talk about what's the power line hum. That's 60 hertz. And you know what it sounds like, that uh, Now let's talk about piano keyboards. So here's a piano keyboard. Middle C is right here. Uh, that's you know, a couple octaves above power line hum. So that's a factor of four. So that's 250 hertz. How many more octaves does a piano have? Well, there's eight octaves on a piano. So there's, it's usually someone in class knows that. And there's four more octaves beyond it. So that's a factor of 16. Uh, so 250 hertz to four kilohertz. And now, do you think pianos are at the end of your hearing? Well, maybe if you're 95, uh, but uh, you know, and but you know, for students, they can hear pretty really well, and they say, "Oh no, you can probably hear one or two more octaves," and so now you're up to 10 or 20 kilohertz. And so then we can talk about, you know, I told them about how when I was a graduate student, uh, we had these function generators which were connected to uh, little microphones, and I would just turn them up uh, to see what my hearing frequency was, and I could hear up to 23 kilohertz, and then. Uh, I'd had to try this experiment again because the students kept telling me, could you turn down the fluorescent lights? And I said, well, why? they're making this high-pitched hum, which I couldn't hear at all. And they said, yeah, it's making me nauseous. Uh, and so they could hear you know, these frequencies they could hear, but I couldn't hear anymore. So I went back and redid the experiment, and I could only hear it at 15 kilohertz. Uh, so I'd lost you know, 8 kilohertz of my hearing. And probably you know, by now, you know, 10 years later, probably another 5 kilohertz are gone. So maybe I'm only up to 10 kilohertz. Uh, but so we could talk about that these are real things. You can see these happening in the world. And I never would have known to do that without seeing this uh, heat map. And so this, you're all the way to the interactive level. The students are dialoguing with a tutor or another student. 
And you know, you as the instructor can see what they're doing uh, and watch it and observe and intervene, uh, but also with other student. So now, in terms of how it worked, or how well it worked, in the semester, so MIT has semesters, uh, there was 90 students and they made 15,000 comments. Uh, and in this PDF form, when I downloaded everything and made annotated readings in this form, there was 200 pages of material for them to read, maybe 180, and there was 1,200 pages of comments that they made. Now, I read every single comment, and the comments were all constructive. You know, they either found mistakes in the text, or they found problems, or they had questions, and other people answered the questions. So uh, the uh, graduate student, Sasha Zaito, he actually studied a sample of 500 comments and just analyzed and categorized every single comment. And they found that 75% of the comments were, the questions students asked were actually answered by other students. You know, so think of that, you as an instructor, that saves a whole bunch of time, which you can then use to prepare lecture, to actually prepare conceptual questions, and prepare interactive questions for the lecture. So it's not just what can digital tools do all by themselves, you know, and certainly they can enable passive things. You can show videos and give text for people to read. They can enable active multiple choice questions. They can enable constructive. And yet, alone, you can't have such the same interactive dialogue with a digital tool that you can with a person, but it can enable that kind of discussion between students and between instructors and their students. And so it's, it's important to think what can they do and what can they enable. And then this kind of interactive discussion in particular that students are doing here, this, you know, the threaded discussion here, that's exactly the kind of reasoning and way of reading that we want to teach them. So one of the uh, discussions I had today was with Cindy Passmore from the School of Education. Uh, and she was saying, well, I wonder in this framework, you know, she, uh, the IFCAP framework, what is it about people who became university teachers uh, that allowed them to actually really understand what's going on despite the passive learning all the way through their education. And so the explanation I came up with is that, because I agreed with all the premises, is that somehow those people, these people, actually could make the passive material interactive. So here's an example of what I mean. You see a formula in a book. Uh, say for the range of a projectile, and it has V squared, the launch velocity squared in it. And you say, why is that V squared? I can see why it's the launch velocity. The faster it is, the farther the rock should go. But why two factors of V? Because I see one factor of V from how fast it's going. Where's the other come? Oh, oh, where's the other factor come from there? Oh, no, it can't be that, because that would give me two factors of V. Oh, it's that, oh, it's the time of flight uh, aloft. Oh, that's, a, in, that's proportional to V as well. So there's my second factor, V. Oh, okay, now it makes sense. That kind of interactive reasoning, if you uh, look at the Vygotskyan framework, that every internal tool that we have, mental tool, actually was in the social plane first. It was in dialogue with somebody, uh, with a teacher, with another student, and then became internalized. Students, most students do not have the internalization of that kind of dialogue. Somehow, the people who became university teachers, they managed to do that. Maybe they learned it young. Maybe they learned it in their family. Somehow, they had a great teacher in school that taught it to them. But I think we can actually teach that to all students. So first, they do it in the social plane. Uh, so. And then, as they get more and more experience with that, that becomes internalized. That just becomes how you read a technical text. Whenever you see something, you wonder, does that make sense? Why should that be true? Oh, what does that connect to? How can I use that in the world? Uh, so the interactive learning then uh, becomes internalized in them, and they can even then turn non-interactive experiences into something interactive. So that's the <coughs> moral of my story, which is that digital tools are a means, but we have to look at the end. Learning is the end. And it's really needed because students are not learning in the traditional ways. Uh, and the ICAP framework is one framework, I think one of the most powerful frameworks for a set of principles that can help us design learning experiences using digital tools, incorporating digital tools. Uh, for example, in some of these ways that can reach high in the ICAP framework in towards the interactive level even. And therefore, 
can produce what we would all love, understanding that might create new ideas. So I wish you every success in using digital tools uh, to improve your students' learning so that they can actually go out and change our world for the better. I've put uh, further readings here. I'll make my uh, slides available. Uh, thank you very much. That's, that's a great question. Well, the question was, what fraction of students participated? Uh, and the answer was 100%. And the reason was I told them that it was required. They, they, what was required is they had to make a decent effort to make comments. And I told them a decent effort gave them full credit, an indecent effort gave them half credit, and no effort gave them zero credit. So then they would say, well, how do I know what's an indecent effort? So I said, well, Potter Stewart, when he was writing his pornography decision for the Supreme Court, said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, and, which is <laughs> also why I called it indecent effort. Uh, and the thing is, what's really strange, and I hadn't expected this, is that you know, science and engineering students are generally quantitatively fairly good. They're not scared of numbers. But when it comes to numbers about grades, their whole model of numbers collapses down to zero and not zero. So you can tell them, well, and this is, by the way, worth 10 to the minus 8 points. And they'll say, oh my god, how do I get my 10 to the minus 8 points? Uh, and then the benefit of that, uh, which also I hadn't expected, was that because they were required to comment, so they were all doing stuff, if you had a question, the best place to get your question answered was to actually go onto the NB system, ask something about the reading. And within an hour, pretty much invariably, you got an answer or another comment or someone furthering the discussion. Uh, but if you hadn't required the commenting or discussion, then a few students would have gone, one of them would have made a question, put it on there, and no one, and no one would have actually answered anything because only the people who had questions would have gone there and then soon found it doesn't do any good and then they would have stopped doing it. And so then if you don't ask, then the number of comments goes down to zero, whereas if you do require, the number of comments went up. So what happened was they, they said, OK, but still, tell us, give us some more guidelines. So I said, OK, well, this is order of magnitude physics here. One comment is not enough unless it's you know, uh, Fermat's last theorem proved in the margin. Uh, and 10 comments is probably too many, but don't let me hold you back. If you want to do that, that's great. Uh, so somewhere in between, uh, so roughly a few. Uh, and what happened was over the course of the semester, they made more and more comments. So they started out by doing a decent effort, and then by the middle of the semester and the end, they were doing well above the call of duty and actually participating and having really long discussion threads, sometimes five or 10 uh, threads, uh, comments long. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if um, you did anything to change the assessments. Uh, so uh, in line with all the, the, uh, the changes that you made to the instruction, uh, whether the assessments had to change and if you were uh, changing them to look for different skills that maybe you were now hoping to build. Yeah, I did change the assessments. So this course in particular was the, you know, the art of approximation. So I wanted to teach them approximation. But it's something, and it's qualitative reasoning, uh, but it's something that they have very little practice with and are terrified by. Uh, so they think, oh my god, if it's not exact, you know, it's got to be wrong. I can't even do it. So they're a bit traumatized by their previous education. So I had to find a way of not act reactivating the basically post-traumatic, you know, fla creating flashbacks in their PTSD. Uh, and so the way I did that was I said, OK, we're going to use the same grading scale for the homework. So the homework questions had things like estimate the oil imports of the United States in barrels per year, roughly. Uh, and I told them, I don't want you cheating by using Google, looking these things up. But then I had to make some uh, way of assessing it such that it wouldn't do you any good to cheat. And then you could actually forget about that and learn. So the assessments were actually the same scale. Two points for a decent effort, one point for an indecent effort, and zero points for no effort. Uh, and then what I had them do, 
is most of these questions, in fact, all of them could be answered on an online system that I wrote. Actually, it was before uh, the MITx system even existed. Uh, but you can now do that with the, MIT, the edX platform. Uh, they would enter their answer with an er estimate of the error, and then they would answer, enter one or two sentences how they came to it. So that would just basically force them to say, yeah, I thought about it, and this is why I thought it was there. And the interesting thing I found, because I switched to that system over several years of uh, teaching the same course, and in the years when I didn't do it, there were always students gaming the system when it had regular grades. They would say, okay, well, I've done X percent already on the homework, and if I just take the final and do half decent, I don't need to do these two homeworks. They just blow it off completely. Uh, whereas what I, f and so I think I had 20% you know, missing rate among the 10 homeworks and the 50 students. So out of the 500 things, 100 were just not turned in. With the eff effort-based system, there was one out of 800 possible assignments the student didn't turn in. So they actually worked harder. And I asked them about it. They said, yeah, actually, we're freed of thinking about grades. We actually can use our mental energy for thinking about the course. So I said, oh, that's exactly what I was hoping would happen. But you know, I'm glad to see that it did happen. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want you to shed some light. Actually, it's a two-part question. The first thing is, with all the money being poured into STEM education, why is that U.S. still ranks the lowest among the European countries and developed countries? I believe it's 14 out of 16. Yeah, and the second part is, is MINT learning different than STEM learning? What's MINT? MINT, M-I-N-T. What is MINT? Which is mathematics, information uh, science, and uh, natural science, and technology. That's what they use in Europe. Oh, is it that different? No, it just adds information. Uh, programming to it, basically. But it's fundamentally the same. But, why, but in the first part, why does, it, why does the U.S. do so bad? Yeah. I mean, partly the U.S. math curriculum is among the worst in the industrialized world. It's the most fragmented. It's the most procedurally focused instead of conceptually focused. Uh, the, it's taught by people who were taught in that same way, so they can't easily get out of that mold. Uh, so the result is when students come to the university, they actually don't understand basically anything. Uh, so, they've, so what happens is the really good students, they've done so many problems. They have this armor plating. Whenever you show them a problem, it's similar to something they've already seen, and they can do it. Uh, and so that was what was happening in my Cambridge students. You know, you show them, they do really well on all the exams, on the equivalent of their six AP exams, but then you actually ask them, okay, now use that to explain the bouncing of a ball. You know, just this, uh, actually understanding how acceleration works, that it's not, you can't say that because the velocity is zero, the acceleration is zero. Because they would actually use the following argument. They would say, well, the velocity is zero, the derivative of zero is zero, so the acceleration is zero. You know, so that shows actually no understanding of what's really going on, but a purely rote application of the formulas. And so England wasn't actually much better. It used to be better in the 60s, but then they only educated 5% of the population for the universities. Uh, so when England went to mass education, they basically dumbed it down uh, unjustifiably. And we did that long ago. So we don't even try for conceptual understanding. Could it be more because of uh, this ICAP hierarchy? Yeah. I mean, more passive than? Oh, yeah. It, in the, yeah. it's, to, it's it's very much passive, so uh, yeah, let me go back to that. Oh, well, I, uh, no, no. so here, yeah, it's very much passive, and so and then there have been moves to try to make it more interactive, but they've been uh, basically many of them misguided. So people have said, look, what we're doing now is totally broken. Students aren't learning anything. Just telling them stuff doesn't work, and that's true. That's passive. So they say, well, what they really need to do is they need to do long project discovery-based learning. That was the whole 60s uh, you know, science reform efforts. But that's a disaster as well. Because just having students talk about their ignorance doesn't actually solve the problem. <laughs> you, know, you can't just generate knowledge out of nowhere. They actually need instruction. But the instruction has to be carefully constructed. <laughs> uh, and that hasn't been done. You need a conceptual analysis of what students really need to learn. And so in math education, part of the problem is that we focus on counting first instead of teaching measurement. So a fundamental improvement would be to actually teach measurement first. And so measurement as the fundamental 
mathematical concept, which everything is trying to get to. Then you don't have, okay, first we do counting, which is integers, and then we have to combine them with all these random rules for adding fractions to get fractions and rational numbers. And then we take limits to get real numbers, by which time students have no understanding what the hell has happened. Uh, and it's not actually in contact with the world. You start with real numbers. You're making measurements. Uh, often these measurements give you integers. Okay, that's fine, but it could be any continuous thing. And you have number lines. And then you get to the sense of scale. Then mathematics is used to help you understand the world. That's not what we're doing at all. So it's a total disaster. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question about course design and like assessing students. If the goal is learning, right, and not giving out grades to students, do you see us moving away from a model eventually where we're testing them and giving out grades? Because the interactive part with collaborative questioning and all of that stuff, if we can get enough students involved and just give grades based off of participation? Well, uh, so they do need it. So I'll show you, this is my spare slide. So my, I'll show you my spare slide. This is, so the uh, evaluation of the MOOCs, I said there were 50 MOOCs. There was 50 kind of standard MOOCs like Coursera, Udacity edX, and there were 26 collaborative MOOCs uh, that were evaluated. But there, this is the 76 here. So they did this evaluation based on this uh, principles of instruction, David Merrill's first principles of instruction. Uh, which are which is outstanding. Uh, it requires even more radical changes to our teaching, I would say. And here is what that looks like. So, uh, and that will answer. I'll in so discussing that, I'll answer your question about uh, grades. So the fundamental idea is that learning should be based on tasks. So the not. Uh, one learning objective, one topic, uh, not topic centered, but also not here, do some project and go explore. Uh, because empirically, that doesn't work. But tasks done right. So a task is something, something similar to what students might encounter in the real world, which could be you know, in graduate school. It could be working in a company. It could be explaining things in the world around them. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a task versus a topic. So topic is, in physics, you teach forces, free body diagrams. Uh, conservation laws. The problem is you now say do something real with it. They can't coordinate these ideas. So a task would be something like, okay, use these things to explain how you pump up a swing. How does it work that just by moving your legs back and forth, all of a sudden the thing is moving back and forth like this? Where did the energy come from? Where does the angular momentum come from? How does that even work? Uh, and I don't think one physics student in a thousand anywhere I've taught could do that after taking introductory physics. But so you centered around tasks like that. Then what do you do? The first step is you have to activate students' knowledge that's related to the task you're going to do. Uh, so how do you see the, you know, forces in the everyday world? Let's do free body diagram for just standing on the ground. Okay, so demonstration, you have to show them the use of these skills. So that's where it's the improvement on project-based learning. You're actually showing them how to do this, so they're not spending all their mental resources searching and not on the content. And there, then the next step is application. So they have to do the step, the tasks, more and more independently. And you give them f cognitive feedback. So that's where the grades come in. It's not the point of the grades to tell other people necessarily how they're doing. I mean, my view is, if other people want to know, let them pay for it. Our job as instructors is to give the student feedback. And I think it actually should be illegal, like a violation of the student's privacy, to tell anybody else. If anybody else wants to know, they should do their own test. Uh, but the student needs to know in their reasoning what went right and what went wrong. So not just this act was wrong, but the model that you're using needs improvement in these ways. And so that's something that currently digital tools are not very good at doing. And so that's one of the limitations. That's where people are involved necessarily. And then again, this is something where digital tools can facilitate, but integration. Students then need to integrate that knowledge into their world view. So they need to defend it, use it, apply it into how they look at the world. And this, again, people are essential here. Uh, the interactive tools like NB can really help that, but you really need that to happen. But here's where the grading happens as formative assessment for the cognitive model students have. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one last question. Hi. Um, yeah. Oh, in your MOOC, um, Street Fighting Mathematics, um, well, I think in the bond angle question, um, you had actually made a mistake, and you put up that mistake. 
for everybody yes. to see. I thought That's that was right. amazing. Yeah. I wanted to know what um, kind of feedback you had from students or from Yeah, I got, yeah, so the example that's raised is so when I was teaching that example in the MOOC of the bond angle, I was trying to, I made a short, a few minute video to illustrate doing uh, reasoning by analogy in a different problem. Uh, and I reasoned by analogy and I came to some conclusion. I posted that whole video. And then after I did it, I realized, oh, the thing is totally bogus. I came to a totally wrong conclusion. Uh, and so then I had this ethical debate uh, within myself. Should I just take it down and basically kick over the traces? I was like, nah, let me actually try an experiment. Uh, I did have mixed feelings about it, uh, just because it makes you look, inf look fallible. Uh, so I. Uh, you're not the champion street fighter anymore. But uh, so I actually said, oh, wait a minute. So I posted a note underneath it. It said, well, I've left this video up here, but it has a mistake in it. And I left the mistake up there so that you can actually see that people make mistakes. And then you have to actually think about what you're doing. And then you might find mistakes too. But you can actually see that it's OK to make mistakes. That's what I want to teach people. And I got a lot of feedback from students saying, that was really valuable. I'm really glad you did that. That took a lot of courage. Uh, and that shows me that it's OK to make mistakes. So I was. After seeing that, I thought, OK, it achieved its purpose. And it was actually better than if I would just done it right the first time. Thank you. Best thing, Professor Mahajan.